Framed. Part 9. 26th of April. Cars today. Jaguar 4.2. Barry and Tone. Weather. Heavy rain. Note. Extreme football. This morning sticks to my mind mostly because of the breakfast. <clears throat> we were in the shop before school when Barry and Tone pulled up in their Jaguar 4.2. They wanted to speak to Dad. Mum came down and said, I'm afraid Mr Hughes has gone away on business. Then she took Max and went back to bed. We all looked at each other. Dad had never gone away on business before, and Mum had never gone back to bed before. I said, what are we going to do? I'll tell you what we're going to do, said Marie. We're going to have a decent breakfast instead of the stuff that makes the mug go yellow. And she took one of the satay pot noodles and squirted boiling water into it from the gazier. I didn't think that this was right in the circumstances, but it did smell good. What's it like? I said. Mm -hmm. Like a mixture of hot peanut butter and string. It's good. Minnie said, maybe we should all have one to get our brains going. We need to make a plan. Does a pot noodle really get your brains going? Minnie read a list of all the chemicals and the E numbers from the side of the car and said, if that lot doesn't make you think, think, nothing will. So I had one. And when Tom came, he had one too. Through a mouthful of noodles, he said, where's Mr Hughes gone then? He's gone away in business, said Marie. Because the garage isn't making enough money. It's completely Dylan's fault. Because he let the robbers stroll off with the mini. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't know that. I wonder what kind of business he's gone on, said Tom. It doesn't matter what or whose fault it is, said Marie. The point is, the garage isn't making enough money. If we want Dad to come back, we have to get the garage, and make more, get the garage to make more money. When you put it like that, it sounded simple. We could turn to crime, said Minnie. Not me, said Tom. Oh, come on, Tom. Just because it went wrong once doesn't mean you can't do it. Try, try and try again. And we'd be helping you, and we'd be helping you this time. Yeah, but I'm reformed now, see. Right then, said Minnie. We've had it. Have we, said Tom. He looked worried. If it's going to make things difficult, maybe I could do just one more crime. No need, said Marie. Think about it. The men are still at the mountain. They still have to drive over the forecourt. There's still a potential map potential market. All we have to do is figure out what to sell them. Any suggestions? I just sat there wishing I'd stop the robbers, or that I could find the car, or even just a clue. Tom said, I could sell my box set of posable turtle action figures. They're highly collectible. It's very good of you, said Marie, but you've already sold enough turtle stuff, Tom. Thanks all the same. Tom said, phew. He couldn't have a party, I don't suppose. Marie went on. It'd be nice to have a party. I've often thought about it. Dad's workshop would make a great party room. We could have music and dancing. And I'm sure people from school will come. And that would generate income how? Asked Minnie. All right, snapped Marie. It was just a thought. Then Marie said, cakes. Everyone gasped. The fact is, she is a genius. As Tom said, I love cakes. And so does everyone, really. We know they've got Cajun chicken wings, said Minnie. But have they got cake? Probably not. We can make the cake ourselves, so no overheads. Yeah, but what kind of cakes though, said Tom. Because ginger cake's not nice, for instance. We'll do it like a menu, so they can order and we don't have to bake unless they want to buy it. And this is a masterstroke. We'll invent cakes. Special cakes designed for men who work up a mountain with works of art. So that's how Picasso pie was invented. And Tetty and Tart. And Tin... Tintoretto turnover and crispy chalk constables. All morning, Minnie kept coming up with more names of painters and Marie kept matching them with cakes. Even Tom helped. They sat down at the computer, giggling and laughing and playing with the fonts and colours. I didn't know the names of any painters or cakes or fonts, so I left them to it. Next time one of them comes down, said Marie, we'll give him the menu. It was good to see Team Hughes working again, even if the captain was away and the team manager was in bed, and I was stuck on the bench. Mam stayed in her room most of the morning because she was missing Dad, which was understandable. I remembered how much of the pot noodles, how much the pot noodles had cheered us up, so I looked in coffee calvacade and decided to come up, decide to make her a mochaccino, a mixture of coffee and chocolate and milk. We didn't have any actual hot chocolate left, so I crumbled a flake into the mixture and took it up to her room. She seemed to like it. I said, how long will it be there? Who? Dad. Oh, Dad, what about him? How long will he be away? Where? 
Away on business? You said he was away on business. Oh, I don't know. A while, she carried on looking out the window. What kind of business is he away on? Hmm. Has he gone to work on the new barrier? Hmm. Well, I said, I can't stand here chatting all day. Actually, I could have, because there was nothing else to do. But man didn't try to stop me, so I went. Donatello had laid an egg on top of one of the butane canisters. It had a feather stuck to it and it was still warm. Immense, but also pointless. I was going to run and tell the others, but then I thought, how much of a difference does one egg make, really? Then I thought how, I sa how sad it was that this hen had gone to all the trouble to lay an egg, that it wasn't going, to, that wasn't going to make any difference. Just like I wasn't going to make any difference. And then it came to me, something that Dad said. Customer relations is about going the extra mile. Why should we wait until one of them comes down to give them a menu? I could take the menu up to them. All right, we didn't have a car, but our granddad's all walked up that mountain to go to work. I could do the same. I ran into the shop. The menus were piled up next to the printer. They looked completely legend. Yellow letters on a blue background. There was no sign of the girls. Tom was in the back. I took a menu and a cagoule and I went. I was going to climb the mountain. I was going to do my bit to make the garage pay. I took my match ball in case there was any chance of a game. It was good walking up. I'd only ever been up in the car before, which is why I hadn't noticed the white stones until now. Every couple of minutes you'd pass one. It was like one of those puzzles where you look at a picture for ages trying to see the hidden face, and then suddenly you can see it. And then you can't stop seeing it. It was just like that. Once I'd spotted a few of the stones, I could see a whole line of them leading up into the clouds, like a piece of string. When I'd been walking for ages, I looked back and realised I hadn't gone, to, gone that far. I could still read the writing on the Oasis Hotel Marvel sign. I nearly gave up then, but I thought about the 4,000 grandads who did the walk every morning, and I thought, it can't be that far if they did it before. They even started to work for the day. I dropped the ball and started to dribble it up the path. I kept thinking how good it would be when there was, a someone, when there was someone who would kick it back to me. I don't remember walking into the cloud. I just remember that suddenly it was colder and wetter than before, and I couldn't really see anymore and the stones beneath my feet were slippy. I picked up the ball and thought about turning back, but then I saw another white stone up ahead. I walked over to it from there, and then I could see the next one, and from there I could see the next one, and then the next one, and so on, and so on. Then I saw something else. It was about the size of a house, but it had a hair growing out of it. Thick, spicy hair. I stayed quiet. So did the hairy thing. So did everything. It was like the whole world had gone, gone quiet, or vanished. There was just me, two white stones, one ahead and one behind, and this big hairy thing. I took a step backwards, I slipped. I lost my grip on the ball. It went rolling off down the mountain. You could hear the crunch of pebbles for, it, pebbles for ages after it disappeared. The thing must have heard it, but it didn't move. As I straightened up, the cloud around the thing sort of unswirled for a moment. It was a big block of slate, a huge block of slate with moss growing all over the top of it. One side of it was smooth, was as smooth as a windscreen when you touched it. I wonder what it was doing there. Maybe it was the last piece of slate they'd cut. Maybe the mine closed before they had time to split it into, into wide ladies or whatever. When you look closer, you can see that there were, there were arrow markings and bits of writing on it. The instructions, maybe for when they would turn it into slates. And there were little drawings too, cut into it, but so lightly that it felt like if you just wipe your hand over them, they'd disappear. It was a row of faces all looking up towards the corner of the rock. I couldn't see what they were looking at, unless they were all really, really interested in moss. So it wasn't a big hairy thing, it was just a rock, which was good. Though I'd lost my football, which was not good. But I still had the menu, which was the point. Walking out of the cloud and into the sunshine was completely mint. Now I know how a car feels when the car wash stops and the hot air blower st starts. I could feel, my feel myself drying out. I could see everything getting brighter and clearer. The slate was blue. The moss looked like it was made of gold. And men's voices up ahead were the best sound ever. Like a party where everyone is waiting for you to arrive. Then as I got nearer, a ball came rolling towards me down the hill. I looked up. Two men in overalls were standing by the canteen, yelling. A third man was running towards me chasing the ball. He nearly had it, but he hit a rock, bounced up and came curving down towards me. I got right under it, chested it onto my right foot and volleyed it. It dropped dead, right at his feet. 
He trapped it, shout, trapped it, shouted, nice one, and waited for me to catch up with him. When I did, he said my favourite sentence. Fancy a game? That's um, part A of, um, well, section A, part nine. So I'm going to do section B next. <laughs>